Joining us right now with a look at what to expect from this space flight is Derek Pitts, chief astronomer at the Franklin Institute. And Derek, this is a historic moment, um, but we're trying to put it in comparison with what we just saw from Richard Branson. What are the differences between these two flights? Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for having me. Well, the first thing uh, that's different about these two flights is that the Branson flight was piloted. There were two pilots on board and uh, two mission specialists along with Richard Branson. This flight of New Shepard will be completely automated. There's no piloting going on here. Uh, the Branson flight was essentially like a space plane. Uh, took off from a runway, lands on a runway again. The Bezos flight with the New Shepard is really a rocket that has a capsule atop. And when it returns to Earth, the rocket portion will land separately autonomously while the capsule lands someplace else all on its own. And the other thing is, I really like this about the New Shepard. It has really big, beautiful picture windows. So your view will be <laughs> excellent. What about uh, the Kármán line? That was not something that, that Branson's uh, space rocket did. This one does cross the Kármán line. Is that a big deal or not? Yeah, this has been a lot of discussion that we've heard over the last week or so about whether or not the uh, folks that went aboard the Branson flight actually reached space because they didn't pass the quote-unquote von Kármán line, which is set at about 62 miles up. And, you know, really much earlier when this was first defined, it was not that high, but it has since been moved up to 62 uh, miles because of, you know, features about the atmosphere, physical features about the atmosphere and how much atmosphere is there and so on and so forth. And this flight of the New Shepard will reach the von Karman line and higher. 16 previous flights of New Shepard, a number of them reached that height without any difficulty. The way I see this is whether it's 52, 57, or 62 miles, if there's a mishap in, in any of this, you're dead no matter what the altitude was. So I sort of think of that as leveling the playing field. And in this sense, you know, if you have the nerve to do it, Okay, go for it. Um, Wally Funk, who is 82, qualified for space flight right along with the Mercury 7. A lot of people don't know, though, at that point, um, she never got to fly because women weren't qualified to go into space. They didn't let them do it, even though she uh, was right there along for the ride. So this is pretty historic from that perspective, too. I think it's really wonderful that she gets this opportunity to realize her dream of flying in space that she had so long ago. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful way to get the story out about this particular flight. And, you know, it's a great celebration of the strides that women have made in space flight. Sally Ride, as we know, in the 1980s was the first woman to fly aboard the space shuttle program in uh, NASA's space shuttle program. But Peggy Whitson, who is a retired NASA astronaut, really holds a tremendous number of records, having been the first commander of a space station mission. She has had 10 EVAs, and her body seems to be m more easily adapted to space than any other astronaut mm. ever. I think she holds a record, really, for having spent the longest amount of time in space cumulatively. Sure. So it's great to see Wally on this. It is. Derek, thank you for your time this morning. We appreciate it. Shepard Smith here. Thanks for watching CNBC on YouTube.